In the late 1950s, the North American XB-70 Valkyrie looked like it had been ripped straight out of the pages of a science fiction novel. With a sharp angular design, six afterburning engines, and the latest targeting navigation and electronic warfare systems America had to offer, the XB-70 was to become the world's biggest, fastest, and highest flying bomber in history. Right until it wasn't. Let's talk about the XB-70. I'm Alex Hollings. And this is Air Power. Looking back now from our vantage point pretty deep into the 21st century, the Valkyrie serves as not just a reminder, but arguably the very pinnacle of the Cold War aviation philosophy of circumventing defenses by flying higher and faster. The XB-70, like America's famed SR-71 Blackbird and its defunct interceptor sister, the YF-12, aimed to deliver on both of these things in classic American style by burning through its budget like jet fuel. Born on the very precipice of what many would come to call the Missile Age, the Valkyrie may have been America's go-to nuclear deterrent if the technology to build it had been available just 10 years sooner. But time waits for no man or machine and the Valkyrie was no exception. The program that was to eventually produce the Air Force's B-70 supersonic bomber began in the mid-1950s, thanks to rapid advancements in the science surrounding supersonic flight. In an incredible bit of irony, the XB-70 was intended as a replacement for the brand new at the time B-52 Stratofortress, which despite having incredible range and payload capabilities, was already vulnerable to Soviet intercept fighters by the time it entered service in 1955. Now, of course, nearly 70 years later, the XB-70 is just one of the many bombers to fail to dethrone America's mighty buff. And that's a list we're still adding to. Pretty soon, the B-2 Spirit and B-1B Lancer will be on it as well. At the time, the primary threats a bomber faced during a mission were intercept fighters and anti-aircraft guns, both of which could be mitigated by just flying higher than they could reach or faster than they could shoot. This approach, while simple in theory, created some huge engineering challenges that would lead to some of the most exotic, dynamic, and capable aircraft ever to take to the skies. And while the XB-70 would certainly be among them, the initial designs for it were even crazier. When the first proposals for what was to be the XB-70 reached the Air Force, they leaned heavily on what was called the brute force concept. Now, this approach called for carrying an absolutely massive amount of fuel for a long-duration subsonic flight toward Soviet territory, and an aerodynamic design that was optimized for high performance during a relatively short sprint through enemy airspace. And the results were some absolutely massive concepts that would leverage disposable external fuel tanks that could be jettisoned once they were depleted. These tip tanks, as they were called, may have been disposable, but they were definitely not small or cheap. As one 1960 congressional report pointed out, each 191,000-pound tip tank was about the same size as an existing B-47 Stratajet, which was an American long-range bomber in service at the time. So it may come as no surprise to the history buffs out there that these ideas did not make it past the desk of legendary Air Force General Curtis LeMay. LeMay was the man behind America's B-29 bombing raids in the Pacific Theater of World War II, and as far as legendary warfighters go, he was about as gruff as you might expect. He dismissed the idea of these massive 750,000-pound bombers outright, saying, and I quote, this isn't an airplane, it's a three-ship formation. With fresh orders to go back to the drawing board, one of the firms competing for this contract, North American, turned to a recently published paper by Alfred J. Eggers and Clarence Silverston from the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. Now, the work was groundbreaking, even if the title was pretty dry. The document was called Aircraft Configurations Developing High Lift Drag Ratios at High Supersonic Speeds. But what it really meant was that aircraft that were designed from nose to tail for a single flight condition could dramatically outperform aircraft that were designed to compromise between both high and low speed flight. In fact, it went on to prove that an aircraft inlet and engine design that was meant to maintain high supersonic speeds could probably offer comparable fuel economy to a design that was meant to fly at entirely subsonic ones. In other words, 
The paper offered the startling conclusion that the Valkyrie could dramatically reduce its fuel needs by just adopting a specifically high-speed design and then keeping the pedal to the metal. North American returned with a proposal for a bomber that was designed from the ground up to fly the majority of its missions at Mach 3 and at 70,000 feet, though you'll find some sources that'll claim 80,000. In order to achieve and maintain these high speeds, their XB-70 was actually designed to ride on the shockwave it produced at high Mach, using a delta wing, slab-sided fuselage, and a large triangular intake on its belly, positioned well ahead of the bomber's engines. This angular intake allowed North America's designers to intentionally position the high pressure created by the shockwave on the bottom side of the wings. In other words, the XB-70 would surf at Mach 3 on a shockwave of its own creation, not unlike a surfer would ride a wave. Despite its very futuristic aesthetic for the day, this new XB-70 wasn't too far off in dimensions from the B-52 it was meant to replace, at least not when compared to the 750,000-pound behemoth that was originally proposed. It was longer, at 185 feet versus the B-52's 160 or so, and much more narrow, with a wingspan of just 105 feet versus the B-52's 185. It boasted a nearly 30-foot-long bomb bay, which was big enough to accommodate any nuclear or conventional weapon in Uncle Sam's arsenal, and that bomb bay was marketed as adaptable to suit special electronic countermeasures or reconnaissance pods to allow their high-speed bomber to serve in non-kinetic roles or jobs that didn't involve dropping bombs. The Valkyrie was to be powered by six General Electric YJ-93 GE-3 afterburning turbojet engines that were rated at 30,000 pounds, even if the truth was probably closer to 29,000. But even if they were a bit oversold, that still shakes out to more than 174,000 pounds of thrust, which was almost three times that of the brand new at the time B-58 Hustler, which was the world's first operational Mach 2 bomber. These engines were lined up on the center line of the underside of the aircraft, giving it a tail view that now looks almost reminiscent of an Imperial Star Destroyer from the Star Wars franchise. Or maybe it'd be more fair to say Star Destroyers were reminiscent of the Valkyrie, as this was about 30 years before George Lucas's movie would hit theaters. The XB-70 was to be operated by a four-man crew, comprised of a pilot, an aircraft commander, a co-pilot, a bomb and navigation officer, and a defensive systems officer. Incredibly, despite sharing a cabin, the cockpit was designed to provide each crew member with their own encapsulated ejection seat that would enclose around them and provide pressurized oxygen for the descent from 70,000 feet. This approach wasn't unheard of and had already found use in the supersonic B-58 Hustler. If that encapsulated seat were to land in water, it would work like a boat, and even came complete with a radio and fishing equipment. Other documents show that the aircraft would carry 45 pounds of survival equipment for each crew member, including cold weather clothing, a hunting rifle, and a week's worth of rations. But it never really said whether or not that'd be included in the ejection seat capsule or not, even though it would make sense for it to be. This ejection system also included a provision for the pilot to remain with the aircraft in their sealed capsule while the other crew members ejected. The pilot's capsule included the stick, which would allow him to make sure the aircraft didn't careen into a populated area or nearby American forces before ejecting himself. So in a way, it was almost like the air masks that would drop down from the top of a commercial airliner in an emergency, except it would completely encapsulate the pilot and allow him to stay more or less comfortable as the airplane burned around him. The fuselage of the bomber, and in fact almost all of its external surfaces, were made using a stainless steel honeycomb-style sandwich of materials that offered a ton of strength for a pretty low weight. And wherever possible, high-strength titanium alloys were also used to keep tightening that belt. That might seem ordinary today, but at the time, it was fairly groundbreaking. And in fact, future President Lyndon B. Johnson and other members of the Senate Preparedness Subcommittee would go on to credit North American for leveraging the lessons they'd learned in the development of programs like their intercontinental supersonic SM-64 Navajo cruise missile, and of course, the hypersonic X-15 research plane. All of the materials used in the Valkyrie's construction had to take into account the incredible amount of heat and pressure an aircraft is subjected to when tearing through the sky at Mach 3. 
Mach 3 was well above what was commonly known as the thermal barrier for aircraft that leveraged aluminum in their fuselage construction. Now, what that really meant was that aluminum-based fighters, like many of those employed by the Soviet Union, couldn't even be upgraded to close this speed gap. They would need entirely new platforms made out of entirely new stuff to intercept the Valkyrie. The XB-70's large delta wing was paired with forward canards, referred to as horizontal stabilizers in a lot of the source material. These provided lift ahead of the aircraft's center of gravity, which allowed for better trim control and reduced trim drag at high supersonic speeds. When using those trimmable canards and the aircraft's elevons as flaps, it would allow this large delta wing to take off and land at lower speeds than would otherwise be possible with this sort of design. Now, this jet may look like a 1980s design, or even a modern-day Tesla pickup truck design, but it was a 1950s design. And you can't help but be reminded of that as you pour over the old marketing materials for this program, where they touted things like the Valkyrie's secondary power supply as extremely lightweight and efficient. They described it as able to provide the equivalent horsepower of a modern V8 engine in one-third the volume and two-thirds the weight. You can practically hear the crackly old announcer voice saying it. This new Valkyrie may have been dedicated to high speeds, but the outermost portions of its wings, or outer wing panels, were actually hinged to allow for improved subsonic flight as well. The panels would lie flat during takeoff in low speeds, effectively extending the wing surface and improving the aircraft's lift-to-drag ratio. Once the Valkyrie was flying at supersonic speeds, those wingtips would angle downward to reduce the wing area behind the bomber's center of gravity, which would reduce trim drag and increase directional stability at high speeds. Now, I've mentioned trim drag a few times now, and without delving too deep into the aerodynamics of supersonic flight, basically trim drag is the drag created by flight control surfaces, mainly elevators and horizontal stabilizers, when they're used to offset changes in an aircraft's center of gravity during high-speed flight, especially supersonic flight. Drag obviously slows an aircraft down and forces it to burn more fuel. So by reducing trim drag, you're giving the Valkyrie longer legs and a bit more speed for the same fuel consumed. The Valkyrie's cabin was pressurized by using the immense pressure of the air pouring into the intake during supersonic flight with an engine-driven compressor to assist as needed to keep the interior feeling like a comfortable 8,000 feet above sea level. Now, this t-shirt flight environment, as they called it, wasn't just valuable for comfort on long-duration bombing missions. It was also about eliminating the need for special pressure suits, like those worn by SR-71 or U-2 pilots. By skipping the time-consuming suit-up stage, it would allow for much faster scramble times in the event of a nuclear war. Pilots could effectively just hop right in and go. And in keeping with that concept, there was discussion of using what were called alert pods, which would mount on the aircraft and effectively keep the engines warmed up. This would allow, again, for an extremely quick scramble time. The Valkyrie program called for a bombing and navigation system that was being developed by IBM. It incorporated gyro-stabilized inertial navigation with automatic star tracking and could continuously provide up-to-date information about time and distance to target. A search radar system with such high definition that its imaging was compared to taking a photograph was to go into the XB-70, and the aircraft's defensive systems operator would be capable of jamming radar alongside conventional countermeasures like flares and chaff. On paper, the Valkyrie would provide the altitude and speed necessary to defeat Soviet defenses, the payload capacity to carry America's most powerful weapons, and the fuel economy to fly more than 6,000 miles without a top-up. In the age of speed and altitude, the Valkyrie would rule the roost. But unfortunately for this envelope-pushing design, the world was changing very quickly around it. And while the XB-70 may have been cutting edge, it cut the wrong edges. The XB-70 may have promised to be the most advanced and capable bomber ever built at the time. But at the time, the future of bombers was very much in question. In 1959, the SM-65 Atlas missile, America's first ICBM, entered service, and that same year, testing began on the UGM-27 Polaris missile, America's first submarine-launched ballistic missile. 
These new weapon systems revolutionized America's approach to delivering nuclear munitions to far-flung targets. No longer was it necessary to put a bomber in harm's way, nor did it seem appropriate to invest heavily in new bomber designs at the dawn of, again, what many thought would be the Missile Age. So as you might imagine, it wasn't long before the politicians that once championed the Valkyrie program changed their tunes. In 1961, newly elected President Kennedy would give the program its final acts, despite him and his Vice President Lyndon Johnson both making statements in its support just before the election the year prior. The program would live on for eight more years as a technology demonstration effort that would field two prototype aircraft designated XB-70As. These aircraft lacked all of the military subsystems that would have made them actual bombers, but they did offer organizations like NASA with an important means to study the realm of supersonic flight. Unfortunately, one of those prototypes was destroyed in 1966 after colliding with an F-104 Starfighter during a photo shoot. The other would find a lasting home in the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. But believe it or not, that's still not quite the end of the XB-70 story, because the Air Force and North American would go on to pitch this jet for a wide variety of jobs, including launching and recovering spacecraft, serving as a supersonic refueler or a supersonic personnel transport, and even as an ICBM launch platform that would deploy Minuteman II ICBMs. None of these efforts, however, were enough to pull this expensive program back off the page and into real production. Bombers, of course, would come back into style, however, thanks in large part to the fact that they can be recalled once launched, which made them a great rapid response option. When you receive an early warning of a potential nuclear threat, you can't take missiles back once you start lobbing them at Moscow. And as time went on, stealth would couple with the benefits of crewed bomber platforms and put strategic bombers right back at the top of America's nuclear strategy heap. But with stealth, of course, came a reduced focus on speed and altitude. And that really put the nail in the coffin for programs like the XB-70 that were meant to lean heavily on those two things. Of course, with the world's renewed focus on hypersonic flight and the recent advent of porcelain-based radar absorbent materials, who knows what the future may hold? And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, don't forget to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.